Matthew 1.18 begins the nativity account in the book of Matthew. Uh, we commonly use either this account or the Luke account, which are the only two gospels that talk about the nativity experience. And Matthew has some uniqueness to it in that uh, they talk about, he talks about uh, the wise men, which is unique to Matthew, and talks about the flight into Egypt, which is unique to Matthew, and the uh, massacre of the innocents, which is unique to the Matthew account, and the return to Nazareth, which again is unique to Matthew. How many of you do occasionally look at the New Hope Community Church, or maybe it's New Hope of Walsenburg, I'm not sure what we ended up with, uh, Facebook page? So did, did you see the numbers that I posted up there? Uh, my last post was, what is the significance of these numbers in Bible study? And I'll give them to you. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Let's all say that together. 5, 12. Five, five, twelve. We could even clap it. Ready? Five, twelve, five, five, twelve. I'm using some really good teacher techniques there. Repetition, uh, incorporating tactile and audio and um, uh, body language, kinetic. Am I right, Jen? All those things? I'd be a good preschool teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, something for you to remember. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. So 5 and then 12, and then 5 and 5 and 12. That is um, the categories of the Old Testament. They have the first five books, which is known as what? The Pentateuch, also known as the Torah, also known as the books of Moses. Yeah, very good. Also known as the first five books. <laughs> the next number is 12. What would be after the Pentateuch? The tribes. The tribes? The 12 tribes? No. 12 books of history. Okay. 12 books of history. And, it, and if, you, if you care to, you could go to the cheat section of your Bible, which is the table of contents. So if you don't like playing Bible drill and th thumbing through, you can go see what page uh, to start on. So you see there's 12 books of history. And then the next five of the 12, five, or the 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, the next five is what, do you know? Poetry. Poetry. The next five books are books of poetry. <laughs> so the next five um, would be what? The major prophets. The major prophets. And then the last twelve of the five, twelve, five, five, twelve. The last twelve are the minor prophets. Why do we call them minor prophets relative to the major prophets? It's not because they have a lesser message. They're just shorter. Okay. Shorter brother does it. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. You could actually, and I haven't done this yet, but you could actually memorize the books of the Old Testament that way because we can kind of memorize chunks of 5, uh, maybe divide 12 by 2 and, and so memorize. You, we know why phone numbers are 7 digits, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's about the maximum average immediate memory capacity, uh, at least up through the 1990s. Now we can't remember diddly because it's all right in front of us. And we all know that our teachers were lying when they say, well, you won't always have a calculator with you. Yes, we do. You won't always have an encyclopedia with you. Well, yeah, we do. Uh, now, the other set of numbers is 4-1-21-1. 4, 1, 21, 1. Clap it. 4, 1, 21, 1. All right? Uh, that's the New Testament. We have four Gospels. We have one history. 
which is what? Uh, Acts. And it's actually Luke-Acts, but we've divided them um, into uh, two books. Um, and 21 what? Letters. Letters. Or if you want to sound Greek, you can say epistles. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then 4-1-21-1, what's the one? One book of prophet, prophecy, which is the book of Revelation. So, in answer to the question, should it come up today, did you learn anything? Yeah. Yes. And then you can go 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. All right. And 4, 1, 21, 1. So here we are uh, in Matthew. We talked quite, about, quite a bit about this um, genealogy, which is just really a lot more interesting than you would think at first glance because of all that it means, particularly to Matthew, who's writing to a Jewish audience, and he wants to ensure that they understand, by the time they read his account of the gospel, that they understand that Christ is king, that he is God, and is the Messiah that was prophesied. Now, as we go to Matthew 1.18, we see the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. Now, but before I proceed, I want us to think a little bit um, about your story, or if you have kids, your kid's story. Um, I remember uh, my birthday was just passed, by the way, thank you. Um, and I remember as a youngster, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, maybe, um, I asked mom about the day that I was born, on my birthday. And apparently it was kind of in the middle of the night, so I apologized for that. <laughs> and um, she, it wasn't too much of a dramatic story, but I do know what hospital I was born at. Um, and I do remember my younger brother, my only other little brother, and actually my only surviving brother, um, when he was born. So I, I know those, some of those birth stories. Do you know your birth story? Some of you may not. Some of you may not. Um, and if, if you do, or if you know somebody else's birth story, would you, what would it look like? Well, this is Matthew's version of what he had heard uh, from eyewitnesses about the birth of Jesus. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. You want to know your story, little Jesus, about the time you were born? Now, the word bastard has a legitimate, ironically, meaning in the dictionary. Jesus was known his whole life from childhood on uh, as somebody who was born to a pregnant, unmarried teenager. Mm -hmm. So, strike one, right? Mm -hmm. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. You know, there's so many times when we tell these precious little Bible stories to little kids, and they don't, it just, it doesn't occur to them that there's some scandal and really difficult things involved. And I think I told you when we were talking about the account of Noah, we, we, we love to tell the story of Noah to the kids and the little bouncy boat and the giraffe sticking its neck out, and we don't tell about all the dead bodies floating around the boat from the complete destruction of the planet. Call her that. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had, and, I, and again, I, I don't, now I, my, my family, the, my mom, uh, our whole, the, the first birth <laughs> was, um, a scandalous birth. Um, you know, having grown up in church as far back as I remember, uh, it took me a little while 
to do the math between my parents' anniversary and my sister's birthday. <laughs> um, and it's, it's really, it's not that big a deal now. Um, but that's how my family started out. Um, so, but I didn't know that, and they, I don't think they really wanted me to know that. Of course, my folks didn't talk about a whole lot of things. I didn't realize that they'd had a, a, an infant die uh, until I was looking through a picture book one time when I was nine or 10. I said, who's that? Oh, that's your brother Michael. He died when he was whatever, 18 months old, three weeks, three months. Um, so we weren't, um, we weren't necessarily anxious to, to tell all of our, our history. Um, you know, I go to my uncle's funeral, he died, who died as a drunk driver in a single car accident, and, and they said, well, is, is Uncle Cecil coming? No, he's still in prison, and you know, just little family things like that that don't, that's just the way it is. And then, um, I, I, one of the things I enjoyed, I, I guess maybe enjoyed is not the word, but it was interesting about teaching college, I had taught a, uh, success in education class. It was an orientation for first-term freshmen about college. Uh, and of course, they all called it suck ed, and we tried to get rid of that, but it was, it stuck. So, um, but when, when kids come together, particularly in a Christian college, which is like an extension of lots of youth groups from all over the Bible Belt, right? Um, and so, there, there's, a, there's a difficulty, particularly in this day and age, in protecting your teens and introducing them into the realities of the real world and that not everything is like your youth group. And the fact is that um, the lessons in lots of youth groups are just really easy lessons. You behave, everything will work out. You behave yourself before marriage, your marriage will be great. There's truth to that, I'm not denying that. Um, we're going to go minister to people on the other side of town, on the poor side of town. Just don't invite any of those delinquent kids to our youth group. Right? Seriously? So, um, the, there, we need to, I think, perhaps, in an age-appropriate, theological-appropriate way, be honest about things like the Christmas story and the Tower of Babel, that's another one. We love the color, those things. And uh, the Garden of Eden, and that cute little serpent, and the apple. So already, and we understand that the um, engagement process in this day was basically marriage without the cohabitation. So it was a very serious legal, moral, social, cultural agreement. It was no small thing. It was not like, well, we're breaking up. The, so you'll notice that there, there act, actually had to be a formal divorce because there were already things that were invested in the family and in finances. And in, in, uh, one of the things that a prospective husband would do is to go build a house, or even, even if it was just an addition on the parent's house, for the bride-to-be. And when Jesus later says, I go to prepare a place for you, that's what the that's what the the husband the person that made the proposal was going to he he that you go get your act together then you come back and then you have the bridal feast. Um, a great a great study in and of itself. And so, um, this was not just oh it's a breakup it's a messy breakup. Did you hear about Joseph and yeah Mary's been running around. I thought she I thought she was a decent little girl. Um, so it was a big deal, and it was very gracious, I think. Um, the, the scripture says, because he was a righteous man, he didn't step back and say, whoa, I didn't have any responsibility for this, I can't believe she cheated on me, I, 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 I made a mistake, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate myself from her. He still cared enough about her um, to just let this pass and let it kind of be a nice, quiet thing, or, we don't know that much about Joseph, and it could have been that this was such a grievous, ego-crushing, culturally, culturally disastrous event that he just didn't want anybody to know. Um, and as soon as he found out, he might 
have been kind of like King David. Let me get separated from this so that when the pregnancy becomes visible, they won't think it has anything to do with me. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So God let him stew about this a little bit. Right? It was not an immediate revelation. The Lord appeared to him in a dream. We're going to see dream appearances. Um, we know that, that there are um, God appearances, theophanies, if you will, messages from God. Sometimes it's an audible voice, sometimes it's a vision, sometimes it's a dream. It's not really a dream uh, personal message very frequently, but we see it several times here in the first couple of chapters of the book of Matthew. Uh, angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. Now, Keep in mind that Matthew's writing to this Jewish audience, and so every time you see something that refers to the Old Testament, whether it's a genealogy or a custom or a pattern uh, or a verse, that, that's just Matthew's way of driving home this point that Jesus is a fulfillment of prophecy. Joseph, son of David, throw that in there. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, that does nothing to solve Joseph's uh, ego problem or social standing or get rid of the shame associated with that event. Um, but God's just saying, I'm in charge. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus. Oh good, something else I don't have any control over. <laughs> Because he will save his people from their sins. Again, that's an allusion to Old Testament prophecy. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then it quotes the Old Testament. I don't know if yours is in bold print or italics or uh, indented. But this is an Old Testament um, recitation. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And they will name him... Emmanuel. That's why we sang that today. That's right. And that's the rest of the verse, which is translated, God is with us. Now, just as an aside, if you go back and look at the origin of this verse, and I believe it's out of Isaiah, I could be wrong. Isaiah but in any case, it's, it's an Old Testament. In, in, the, in the circumstance where this was stated by the prophet, it did not look like it was a messianic prophecy. It was talking about somebody else that was going to be born of a virgin young woman. Okay? So what we see in some biblical critique is, is a critic would look at this and say, you're just trying to mash this into a prophecy because you want it to look like it's a legit prophecy, but if you look at the context, it's not really. Well, listen, there are lots of dual meaning prophetic statements in the Old Testament, um, and so they can apply to something now and something later, or something symbolic and something literal. So that's not. This is not going to throw me off. And there are lots of subtle um, contextual prophecies in, again, not just words, but in patterns, in people, all kinds of different shadows of meaning in the Old Testament that have prophetic value. So this was something that would have been meaningful, would not have been misinterpreted by a Jewish reader who knew the Old Testament as something that was, they would say, oh, yeah, sure, that's, I could see that being a Messianic prophecy. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. That is also often a preschool edit. <laughs> and he named him Jesus. Now, we go to uh, chapter 2. Wise men visit the king. I know that we have heard a ton of Christmas 
ceremonies or, and, and sermons and uh, cultural icons and songs. One of the things that is important for us as Christians embedded in a certain culture is to look at scripture to understand the truth of an event that is recorded in scripture. Because it, besides the Santa Claus and the elf thing, and I don't know how you dealt with that in your family, um, I'm a little troubled by people that go way overboard on Santa Claus and way overboard on the Easter Bunny and way overboard on the Tooth Fairy. And Oh, but Jesus is real. A little mind-boggling for a kid, I think. Uh, I came out okay. Um, and you and I grew up in the Ozarks, so the Tooth Fairy was very, very busy. <laughs> Until you're about 35, and then... Um, but, so true or false, were there three kings? We don't. There were three gifts. There was a song about three kings. And were they really kings? Or who, who were these people? Now you've probably heard the historical setting. But let's talk about this for just a little bit and then we'll, then we'll close. Um, do you remember any character in the Old Testament who was a member of a, a mystical group that knew about dream interpretation and foretelling the future? Daniel. 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 Um, so these guys a few hundred years later were descendants of that same group of mystics and not only did they have um, the reputation for having spiritual power uh, necromancing talking to the dead astrology reading the future and the and meanings in the stars and um, um, seances and those kinds of things now Daniel didn't do any of that silliness and, and by the way, because we're going to talk about an astronomical event, which is this star that has been a mystery to us over the years. The reason that we should not mess with astrology, and I'm saying not even for entertainment value. Um, and if you do, don't go to a Chinese restaurant the same day you read your astro, your, your, your zodiac sign, because you might get conflicting reports and just go home. Um, so there's a very clear prohibition against divination in Scripture. We don't rely on anything other than God, the wisdom that He gives us through His Word. So we don't need to go for a reading. We don't need to use the Ouija board. Um, I had one when I was a teenager and I was convicted and tore that thing up and burned it. Because um, I was way into a cult when I was eight, not like Satan worship or anything, but I was, I was reading a lot about ESP and, and astral projection and uh, cards. Um, in fact, one year for a birthday, I think I was in junior high, maybe eighth grade, I got a, uh, a Kreskin ESP kit. Anybody remember the amazing Kreskin? And um, we were in, in class, and I think this might have been a, either a teacher-sponsored event or she was letting us do whatever we wanted to do. And, you know, they, they have these cards, one's got a circle and a star and a, you know, different shapes, square, triangle. And they would hold a card and they would say, do you know what this card is? And if you had some kind of ESP, extrasensory perception, you could tell what the card is. Well, I was on the other side and somebody else was holding the card, the class was behind them. And they would hold a card up and I would say what I thought it was. And they'd put the card down, and then the students would gasp a little bit. And I would guess this card. No, they'd put it aside, but the next one that appeared, the students would gasp a little bit. 
And for like 10 cards in a row, I was guessing the next card rather than this card. Now, I don't know if that means anything, but I think it may because I've been a little off all my life. <laughs> Just missed it. But we don't mess with those things once we come under conviction. We don't mess with those things because we don't need them. And it shows a lack of faith. I told you about my brother a little bit uh, when his son was murdered and the, uh, he had a picture of the accused murderer and he would pray that God would render justice and he would also bury the picture upside down in his backyard because that was supposedly a ritual that would bring a curse on the killer. And I said, Phil, I don't understand what you're going through, but you can't try to talk to God on this side of your mouth and talk to Satan on this side of your mouth. Amen. So, do we do that? Do we do that in, in, some, in some way? So, here's my point as we begin to talk about these wise men. We're, we're not, this is a theory, I can't prove it. We're not necessarily told not to try to read the future in the stars because it's, it's bogus. Because there may be some truth. There's some scriptural references that might give you an indication that God really does speak in the stars. Um, and some anthropologists will tell you that there are disparate cultures that never had any contact, but had the same zodiac system and the same general names for the signs of the zodiac. And these stars in, in the ancient world, I'm told, have um, significance by their position. They have a number attached to them. They have a letter attached to them. And so their names come from that kind of numerology uh, mystery rather than the shape. There, there, you can't tell me there's a guy that looks like Orion or a bear. Uh, or a scale or a crab. You can't connect the dots. I've done enough connect the dots at Denny's with the kids meal to, to, to know that that doesn't make sense. It does make sense that there's a more mystical thing to it. So, I don't know if that makes sense. But what I'm saying is um, these people had a, a gift of study, whether it was intuitive or psychic, I don't know. But they had the gift of studying these signs and history, and they knew that at some point, some king was going to be pointed out by some astronomical sign. And so when they saw this star that we talk about, that the, that the Bible records, it meant something to them. Now, they were not only uh, influential because of their uh, great wisdom and knowledge. They were academic, not just spiritual gurus. Uh, they, were, they were also a political power, and a strong political power. And so if you were to look at the history of um, this region, and who was ruling what, and what the geography was, and, and who was in charge, and who fought who, you'll see that these uh, groups, this group of people, um, that, uh, that these wise men were a part of, had, had struggled off and on and had actually been real kings, real rulers uh, of these countries. So when you look at Herod, and by the way, there's a bunch of Herods in the Bible, don't get confused by them. So this particular, but there was not a good Herod. There was never a good Herod. Um, there was Herod the Great, there was uh, Herod Agrippa, there was Agrippa II, there was uh, uh, Herod Antipas, or Antipas. Uh, so there are a lot of Herods, but this is the one that was uh, around at the time of Jesus' birth. So what all of the Herods in the dynasty would do is that if they saw somebody that was rising to power or was a threat to their kingdom, and by the way, he was just appointed, this Herod was appointed by Rome, which was ruling the territory at the time, and so he had a political position, so he had people that he had to kiss up to, and the group of Jews was one of those groups that he had to kiss up to. That's why they had this beautiful temple uh, that his dynasty had built, Solomon's temple, uh, because he was trying to curry favor with the Jews. He was not Jewish. 
So anybody that got Herod's way would either be cleverly politically wiped out or simply assassinated. And um, this particular Herod killed a couple of his own kids because he didn't want them to be king prematurely. So this guy was a vicious, vicious guy. And so clever and so um, astute politically. We know people that may have limited moral character, but they achieve success because they're very clever and politically astute. Don't forget to vote Tuesday. <laughs> Men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. Now, astronomers have tried to roll back the clock and figure out what this was. Which, you know, what Cheryl and I lately have enjoyed sitting on our uh, unfinished deck and looking at the stars at night and saying, you know, is that a satellite? Is that moving? Is that Venus? Is that a plane? Um, but stars don't move very fast. Uh, so to think that this was like, oh, well, or follow that star, I, it, it might have been a comet, it might have been just a supernatural illuminated body that directly showed them, boom, where Jesus was. Um, and I'm inclined to believe that as much as, as anything. Because remember, and, and one of the other things that we're going to see here, remember that some prophecy is in pattern, one of the other things that we're going to see here in both the baptism and the this, this subsequent uh, temptations in 40 uh, days in the desert, we're going to see some parallels between some great historic uh, Old Testament events and some things that happened in the life of Jesus. And what was one way that the people of Israel were led through the desert? By a pillar of light, yeah. right? So it could have been the same thing. I don't know. We don't know. Nobody knows. Don't, t don't let anybody tell you they know. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes. Now, why would all the people be disturbed? I can understand why he would be disturbed. Oh, there's a king being born, and it was prophesied. This can't be good for me. But when there's... Um, if the citizenry knew anything about the king's concern, about Herod's concern, they would be concerned too, because... Who knew what, what, what he was going to do? So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. Another prophecy fulfilled. Because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so I too can worship him. What a liar. Well, and we know what happened. Um, what we also have to understand is that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this as an illustration this afternoon, not to spoil anybody that might uh, come to the Bible study this afternoon, but I'm going to bring a nativity scene and show you how many lies and myths our kids are taught <laughs> about the nativity scene. Um, right. Um, so, we don't know how old Jesus was by the time the Wise men got there. Uh, we don't know, he was still in Bethlehem, but he didn't necessarily still be in that uh, cave or inn or back room or uh, feed store or barn. We don't know. We don't know. Um, so why is this important? Why not just stick with the Merry Christmas theme and all the things that we see on the Christmas cards and all that we see on the... TV specials and, and just go ahead and integrate that Christmas tree and Santa Claus with the, you know, my, my, my favorite um, little meme is Santa kneeling in front of the baby Jesus. And by favorite, I mean makes me want to throw up. Um, but if you've got a card that way, just that's, you know, that's cute. I get it. We're saying that there's nothing, you know, more, more powerful. Um, 
But let, let's just know what the Bible says. Because the Bible speaks to us with a very specific message, a very intentional, a very purposeful message. And the more we know about the reality of Scripture that uh, we rely on rather than what culture tells us or what culture wants us to believe, um, or even that Christmas even ought to be a thing <laughs> in Christian culture. Um, we need to make sure and understand the word. And I'm not a party pooper. You do Christmas the way you want to do Christmas. Um, but uh, Matthew tells us about the real story. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the record of Scripture, both old and